the city of lights, the city of love, the capital of fashion, even the capital of the world. Throughout the centuries, Paris has earned many names, each contributing to the face of the French capital. The banks of the Seine, Montmartre, and the Latin Quarter tell tales of artists, of Dumas, Zola, and Victor Hugo, who immortalized the city's atmosphere in literary works, of painters who committed it to canvas. Every street corner is familiar through French films. We almost expect to see Jean Gabin, Belmondo, or Alain Delon pass by. The streets and squares remind us of the Sun King, or the Man in the Iron Mask, or Napoleon. The tresses of the cafés resound in our imagination, but sometimes in reality, with the old chansons of Edith Piaf and Yves Montand. The sails of the Moulin Rouge turn incessantly. In the quiet halls of the Louvre, Leonardo's Mona Lisa smiles mysteriously. Lovers' rendezvous on the Pont Neuf. The traffic never ceases to encircle the Arc de Triomphe. And the iron girders of Tour de Eiffel tower above the snow-white stone tracery of Notre Dame and Sacre Coeur. In the hustle and bustle of the city of nine million, it's advisable to use the extensive underground and bus network to get about town. But many tourists prefer to board one of the numerous sightseeing ships. The Seine, which bisects Paris, is not very wide. It's a river channeled between stone quays, but from all points it provides wonderful views of the city. Its banks are lined with famous palaces, that of the Foreign Ministry, of the Légion d'Honneur, which also houses the museum of this famous state award, the Orsay Collection, transformed into a museum from a gare, a train station, the Académie Française, and the Mint Building. A number of famous historical figures lived in the houses along the quays. For example, Voltaire, Anatole France, Baudelaire, Oscar Wilde, and Richard Wagner. There remains no trace of the infamous jail, the Bastille. Only the square on which it stood between 1370 and 1830 keeps the name alive. The citizens of Paris tore down this hated symbol of oppression during the French Revolution. Here is where Dumas' hero, the man in the iron mask, was incarcerated. But the Bastille also held the Count of Calistro, Marquis de Sade, and Voltaire. Napoleon planned a gigantic fountain of elephants for the empty square, but his plans were never realized. Instead, the architect Alavoie raised a memorial column 52 meters high and 4 meters in diameter, with the statue of the Spirit of Freedom atop. The column is also a lookout tower. If you climb its 240 steps, you're rewarded with a superb view of the eastern part of the city. Victor Hugo, one of the best-known French literary figures, was born in 1802 in Besançon. He was 30 years old when he moved into number 6 Place de Vosges, opposite the equestrian statue of Louis XIII, and lived there until his death in 1885. The 400-year-old building now houses exhibits of the writer's belongings, furniture, and manuscripts. Hugo's name became famous primarily through two novels, Notre Dame de Paris and Les Miserables. Few know that it was as a poet that he gained membership in l'Académie Française. He often illustrated his own volumes of poetry, and his drawings and graphics are on display in the museum. Pablo Picasso, the most outstanding figure of 20th century modern painting, was born in the fall of 1881 in Spain. His father was also a painter, and it was he who discovered his son's talent. Pablo was 18 when he moved to Paris with his friends and rented a studio in Montmartre. What was his secret? Lordly in poverty, larger than life in cheek, grievous in joy, a real extreme Spaniard, much of an exhibitionist, and radiantly human. He could not live without love, writes his biographer. And so it was. Among his many affairs, seven women became his real partners, his muses. Four children were born out of his liaisons. His loves heralded new stages in his art. He liked to paint portraits and nudes, but he often put on canvas the destitute, the fallen, freaks, prostitutes, and beggars. His most famous work, though, is political in inspiration, The Dove and the Antiwar Guernica. 
The Pantheon of Paris stands atop the 60-meter hill of St. Genevieve. Originally intended as a church, it changed functions often, according to the whim of state power. The church is the work of Soufflot, the royal architect, who wished to erect a copy of the Roman Pantheon. The building is 110 meters long. Its width is the same as the height of the dome, 83 meters. This is where Foucault conducted his famous pendulum experiment. The building is the final resting place of Voltaire, Diderot, Victor Hugo, and Zola. A torch rises out of Rousseau's tomb, signifying the lasting power of his work. Numerous military officers, politicians, and presidents of the Republic are interred here, while the kings of France are buried in the Basilica of St. Denis. Look above the Corinthian columns of the entrance and you'll see the frieze carved by David d'Angers with the allegorical figures Liberté and La Patrie. Statues line it on either side, French artists, politicians, and soldiers, with Napoleon at their head. Three famous buildings face the Pantheon, the Hotel de Ville, or City Hall of the 5th District, the Law Faculty of the University, and the famous Library of St. Genevieve, with its 700,000 volumes, the richest collection in Paris. The tombs of Pascal and Racine are the treasures of the nearby Église Saint-Étienne-des-Monts. The small church building is also famous because its façade synergizes three architectural styles. This is the only church in Paris which retains the Jubé, the interior pulpit balcony, to which a circular staircase led and from where the Gospels were once preached. France's most famous cathedral, Notre Dame, was built on the Ile de la Cité, the small island in the middle of the Seine. Its measurements are awe-inspiring. Its 69 meters of height, 130 meters of length accommodates 9,000 worshippers. According to art historians, the building represented a turning point in Gothic architecture and was the first of the classic great cathedrals, followed by Chartres, Amiens, Reims, and Strasbourg. The plan of Notre Dame carries Romanesque influences. No wonder, since its cornerstone was laid in 1163. The plans for the church were drawn up by Bishop Maurice de Sully in great detail and included the interior and exterior statuary. However, neither the bishop nor his successors were able to complete the plans, for despite the generosity of the parishioners, there was never enough money to build domes on top of the towers. Thus, Notre Dame is still unfinished, but it does not seem to bother anyone. The structure withstood the storms of time for four centuries until the dawn of the 18th century brought the winds of revolution, which swept away everything that irritated Republican eyes. The heads consequently then removed from statues were found only in 1977 during the renovation of a Paris house. It was Victor Hugo's novel that called attention to the sorry state of the cathedral, bereft of its glories. The hunchback Quasimodo's romantic story is constantly reborn in plays, illustrated stories, feature and animated films. The leading role has been played by Lon Chaney, Charles Lawton and Anthony Quinn, while the role of the beautiful gypsy girl has attracted a number of stars, from Gina Lola Brigida to Salma Hayek. When the novel first appeared in 1844, it brought about a popular movement to save the cathedral. The architect Violette Le Duc performed a miracle. It was he who placed the portions of the building we now feel to be most authentically medieval. The relics, plans and drawings of the original and rebuilt cathedral are displayed in a separate museum at number 10 Rue de Cloître Notre Dame. The history of the church is documented in several books. Of the multitude of historic events to have transpired in it, it suffices to recall the coronation of the English Henry IV as King of France, the rehabilitation process of Jeanne d'Arc, the wedding ceremonies of Mary Stuart and Margaret Valois, and the funeral of Charles VII and Francis I. Those wishing to take a picture of a cast-in-stone Quasimodo or a water-spouting gargoyle have to climb 387 stairs. The other tower is the home of Notre Dame's Big Bell, weighing 13 tons. It is a distinguished giant, only rung on significant occasions. 
The cathedral's three portals are named Last Judgment, Portal of the Virgin, and the Portal of St. Anne. Above them, a beautiful stained glass rosette window breaks the monotony of the stone walls. Part of the statuary of the Royal Gallery dates back to the era of Sully, who himself appears between the windows, but the ornamentation of the portals is largely the Duke's restoration. The reliquary at the cathedral guards a piece of the Cross of Christ along with a nail, though the authenticity of these relics is debated even in ecclesiastical circles. An archaeological museum has been opened close to the cathedral to house the artifacts unearthed during the excavation of the square's underground garage. Also nearby is the zero-kilometer marker from which all distances in France are measured. After all, the island is the cradle of the city. Its original inhabitants, boatmen, fishermen, and traders are regarded as the founders of Paris. The tiny island could not protect them from Julius Caesar's legions, who conquered Lutetia. The name means swamp in Latin, just as the French word marais, which survived as the name of another part of Paris. It's hardly possible to find Roman remains on the island. Rather, everything seems to be a reminder of the 19th century Bohemian Paris. Latter-day Toulouse-Lautrecs ply their trade on easels mounted on cafe terraces. The city squares are infused with the aroma of French gastronomy. Shoppers exit boulangeries with long baguettes under their arms. On the terraces, fresh croissants, pan bagnes, and croque monsieurs are consumed with café. Every Frenchman is a real wine connoisseur, and food is of central significance in all of France. It's not only a question of which wine goes with what food, but also in what kind of glass and at which temperature. Every meal is uniquely spiced, and each meat has its own sauce. Cheese is never forgotten as the fitting end to a meal. The Seine's bridges and the buildings along the quays define the city's atmosphere and moods. Ile Saint-Louis is connected to the shore with four bridges and to the Cité with one. Seven bridges arch over the water between the Cité and the shore. Eleven span the Seine farther. One of the most famous is the deceptively named Pont Neuf. The name means new bridge, although in fact it is the oldest. Henry III laid its foundation in 1579. In its time, the structure was a veritable technical triumph. It was the custom in those days to line the sides of bridges with houses, wherein craftsmen and merchants had their dwellings. Pont Neuf had no such houses. You could lean on the balustrade and gaze down at the river. The roadbed of the bridge was paved, which was a rarity at the time. What's more, there was even an equestrian statue in the middle of the bridge, an obstruction for real equestrian traffic to maneuver. Beneath the central pillar of the bridge was a lock which supplied the royal palace, at that time the Louvre, with water. The tragically inclined film Lovers of Pont Neuf was a huge box office hit some years ago. It's worth mentioning that the Quai d'Orsay provides access to the sewers of Paris, which played a role in several literary works. We need only mention Eugène Sue's The Secrets of Paris and Les Miserables. The length of the main sewer is 30 kilometers long. Group tours of the sewers are conducted by special guides. You won't meet Jack the Ripper here, but just as London had its notorious criminals, so had Paris. The most famous imaginary detective here was called Arsène Lupin. His creator, Maurice Leblanc, even had his hero fight a duel with Sherlock Holmes, which the gallant French author arranged to be a draw. But the French capital had its real live outstanding detective, Vidocq, a burglar turned police who is credited with founding the modern police force. Several films and novels based on his autobiography attest to his legendary skills. His character was last played by Gérard Depardieu in a film made by Pitoff. Tourists thronged to enter one of the wings of La Conciergerie. Those in the other wing would gladly exit since the building is part of the Palais de Justice, which was once a prison during the Revolution and still serves as a holding penitentiary today. The impressive building is a real cavalcade of styles. Beneath its Gothic and Romanesque spires, you can see Neo-Gothic, Egyptianesque, and modern additions. Its beautiful medieval halls are must-see tourist attractions. The clock in the square tower has been marking the passage of time since the 14th century. This was the first of Paris's public clocks. 
Behind it, in a vaulted room, lived the royal clockkeeper, close on hand in case time stopped. One of the three cylindrical towers served as the royal treasury, though which one was never revealed, for obvious reasons. If we can get there, it's by all means worth taking a little walk around the island. Walking around the building, we notice that the Palace of Justice is guarded by artistic wrought iron fences. The Conciergerie surrounds Saint-Chapelle, the other famous building on the island. The French Emperor of Constantinople pawned Christ's crown of thorns acquired from the Holy Land with some Venetian merchants. He couldn't repay the money, and so that the precious crown would not be lost, the King of France, Saint Louis, ransomed the crown. The chapel was built to house the holy relic. We're cruising eastward towards the Saint Louis, where the city's richest and most prominent aristocrats have their residences. The Cité is connected to Châtelet Square by the Pont de Change, the one-time bridge of the money merchants. Châtelet Square is now one of the busiest nodes in the city, where four metro lines converge. Traffic on the square must have been a real nightmare in medieval times. To start with, it housed the fish market and the similarly not too aromatic abattoir. What's more, it was also the site of the infamous morgue. Each body found on the street or fished out of the Seine was put on public display here. Cutthroats lurked in the alleyways, and the victims of illegal duels joined their prey alongside the bodies of destitute downs and outs. The citizens of the area could begin to breathe easier only at the start of the 1800s, which is when the modern face of the square emerged with its two theaters and triumphal fountain. Many Parisians also consider the Pompidou Center to be a nightmare, although less odiferous than the Chalotet used to be. However, the three decades that elapsed since its inauguration have sufficed for most to make friends with the strange exterior of the cultural center, designed by the Italian Renzo Piano and the Englishman Richard Rogers. Georges Pompidou was still president of the Republic when he announced the architectural competition for a grand cultural complex to house the modern arts. In the museum, dedicated to modern art, are works by Dali, Chagall, Picasso, Henri Moore, and Vasseray. The complex also houses the Center for Industrial Design, the Research Institute for Music and Acoustics, as well as a library and archives. The Center's park is a favorite haunt of neighborhood youths. In fair weather, crowds lounge on the lawn, many on their lunch hour, munching sandwiches. If a foreign tourist would like a room at the Hotel de Ville, that would be as big a gaffe as choosing last minute as a holiday destination. For the Hotel de Ville is not a hotel at all, but the name of City Hall in French. The City Hall of Paris stands north of the Cité, between the Quai de l'Hôtel de Ville and the Rue de Rivoli on the square which was called Place de Grève up to the time of the Revolution. The administrative center of the city is really monumental. It occupies 11,000 square meters and its Renaissance facade is 155 meters long. Its cornerstone was laid in 1533, but this was also the earlier site of the city's administration. The square in front served as a locale for executions and public celebrations. City Hall was a symbol of royal power and thus came under siege during the Revolution, just like the Bastille. In 1800, Napoleon reorganized the administration of Paris, the new structure staying in place for 167 years. Every tenth of France's more than 900 museums is in Paris. In addition to the Louvre, a must-see is the collection of Impressionist paintings in the Musée d'Orsay. Part of the material that overflows the archives of the Louvre is on display at the Palais de Tokyo. Worthy of mention is the Cluny Museum, rich in medieval material, and the museums dedicated to Picasso and Rodin. There are almost as many theaters as museums. Of course, in most of them, a knowledge of French is de rigueur, and in fact, in some of the cabarets and chansonniers, even mere French is not sufficient for understanding Parisian humor. 
Among the theater's musicales, the Casino de Paris and the Olympia are outstanding. This is where the careers of Gilbert Bicot, Charles Anavour, and Mireille Mathieu were launched. The traditional Parisian operetta is being replaced by musicals and rock operas. Revue theaters are a characteristically French invention and, as such, are worthy of being included in our program. Opera is performed only in the Grand Opera, but the plans for a folk opera have been entertained for decades. Concerts are usually held in the Palais de Congrès, in the Palais Chalot, and in the Théâtre de champs élysées One of the most beautiful of the Seine bridges is named after the Russian Tsar Alexander III, an ally of the French. It is 160 meters long, 40 meters wide, and is ornamented with statues. Its spectacular steel structure is the work of the architects Rissal and Albi. The bridge offers excellent vistas. The view of the Dome of Les Invalides is particularly beautiful. The gilded statuary of the 500-meter-long and more than half as wide esplanade is lined up along an important traffic node. Buses to Orly Airport start from here, and there's a subterranean train station beside the underground garage. The trains run below ground for quite a while, not to interfere with the life and views of the city. Trains to Versailles also run from here. The vast hall of the Grand Palais was originally built for the Paris World Fair and Expo of 1900, and its 200-meter-long and 45-meter-wide glass structure came to be used for various other exhibits and events. After a hiatus of 12 years, it was reopened in 2005 in its original glory as a cultural center. The neighboring Petit Palais, built at the same time, has housed the Fine Arts Museum for a century. In the park, there is a commemorative statue of Winston Churchill, the wartime Prime Minister of France's ally, England. The huge tree-lined square of the Esplanade leads to the Palais des Invalides and its dome. These were erected by the Sun King for his sick or wounded soldiers. Today, it is the site of the city's military command. The courtyard of the building is where military decorations are awarded and where the last farewell of distinguished deceased military commanders takes place. The Musée de l'Armée boasts perhaps the world's largest collection of weapons. Its courtyard is lined with famous ancient cannons. The Twelve Apostles of the Prussian King Frederick I are proudly displayed here. One wing of the museum houses maquettes of France's forts and ports. The first of these models were made by Vauban, the Sun King's famed military engineer. The Memorial Museum of the Two World Wars is housed in the building's other wing. The artifacts of the First World War are particularly rich. Even one of the Marne taxis is on display. In a move unique in the annals of military history, General Galliani sent 1,200 reinforcements by taxi to shore up defenses at the Battle of the Marne. You can find displays of military awards, decorations, and insignias in a separate pavilion. The basis of the 40,000-item weapons collection was established by Louis XIV, but later rulers contributed innumerably. One can view the arms, armor, and battle dress of French kings and commanders, but also of foreign leaders. Napoleon's relics fill separate rooms. Here are practically the complete furnishings of his room on Ile St. Helene, as well as his coat, into which he is customarily pictured as having stuck his hand and his characteristic hat. If you're a connoisseur of the military arts, old battles, or merely interested in history, you cannot afford to miss the Musée de l'Armée. The best comment on the extent of its riches is the fact that the admission ticket is valid for two days. The Dome of Les Invalides is one of the French capital's best-known features. The architectural achievement of Jules Hardelin-Mansart would, of itself, not make it so, 
but no tourist to Paris wants to miss visiting Napoleon's tomb. It is not just the emperor who rests here, but also his siblings, favorite commanders, and even the eaglet, his son. Napoleon Bonaparte's tomb stands in the circular crypt in the center of the dome. It's a fitting testament to his place in world history. The casket, made of red porphyry, rests on a green granite base on the white marble floor. The marble comes from a small Greek island, the granite from a French quarry, and the porphyry from Karelia in Russia. By the time of Napoleon's death, the memory of where the ancient Romans obtained red porphyry for their emperor's tombs had been lost. The story of the expedition which searched for the costly stone, found it and shipped it to Paris, merits its own novel. The emperor's sword is shown in a special wall display, while his first coffin and funeral cortege are on view at the nearby Église Saint-Louis. It's common knowledge that the ruler died in exile on Ile Saint-Hélène, and he was placed in his final resting place 19 years later. The largest public park in Paris is the Tuileries Garden to the west of the Louvre. Got its name from the brick kiln workers who plied their trade here. It was designed by the overseer of His Majesty's Gardens at the request of Catherine de' Medici. Locals and tourists now repose in the cool shade of its evergreens or sun themselves on the shores of the small lakes. Two pavilions stand at the end of the park, which represents the garden culture of this Mediterranean country. The Orangerie houses traveling exhibits, while the Jeu de Pommes features a permanent exhibit of Impressionist paintings. Napoleon III originally had the building built as his games house. Of these once very popular structures, only one remains on the Quai de Bourbon. The Tuileries Garden is also famous as the spot where an enterprising entrepreneur first rented out lawn chairs. And this was also where the first of the city's public toilets were located. In 1783, in the heroic age of flight, it was from here that Jacques-Alexandre Charles' hydrogen-filled balloon rose skywards. You can still ride skywards today on the giant Ferris wheel erected in the garden. You can ride the merry-go-round or choose several other ways to get dizzy. You can have a picnic in the summer, and if you haven't brought food, you can buy it in the very French bistros. Those working in neighboring offices and banks often spend their lunch hours here. Kids flock here during summer vacation or after school to play ball games, fly kites, or walk dogs. If you think Paris has only one Arc de Triomphe, you're mistaken. The smaller one, the Arc de Triomphe de Carousel, was erected at the same time as the larger, more famous one. Only three kilometers separate the two arches. In between the two, on the Place de la Concorde, the obelisk rises to great height. The Arc originally announced Napoleon's triumph and was adorned with one of the spoils of war, the statuary of Venice's St. Mark's Square. However, the Austrians eventually returned the stone horses and chariots to Venice. After the restoration, an allegorical figure of peace was substituted for the statue of the emperor. The Louvre, which we now know as one of the world's foremost museums, was built as a royal castle during the reign of Philippe Auguste in the 13th century. To be exact, it was only intended to house the treasury, the royal archives, a library, and weaponry. The ruler himself had his shining court in one of the picturesque Loire castles. After two centuries, Francis I decided to break with tradition and move into Paris. He commissioned the architect Pierre Lescaut to plan a palace fit for a king. Catherine de' Medici joined this castle with her Tuileries palace by having a long new wing built. Louis XIII quadrupled the size of the palace, and the Sun King, Bonaparte, and Napoleon III all enlarged it. Recently, in the 1980s, the courtyard of the Louvre saw the completion of the controversial Glass Pyramid. The collection of the Louvre grew out of a long succession of French rulers. 
The museum was first opened to the public in the summer of 1793, following the French Revolution. The number of exhibited artifacts now exceeds 200,000. The catalogues of Egyptian and Greco-Roman material each contain 40,000 items. Jean-François Champollion played a large part in enriching the Egyptian collection. It was he who first decoded the hieroglyphics of the Rosetta Stone. And it was under his direction that the museum acquired the statue of Venus de Milo. The art collection of the Louvre is so vast that its catalogues are close to a thousand pages long. Along the centuries, many famous private collections ended up here, such as that of the Roman Count Campania, or the treasuries of the French collector Lacaze, or the Walter Gallery. The canvases of Tiziano, Raffaello, Michelangelo, and of a whole host of Dutch painters, Dürer, Cranach, Holbein, Rubens, and Rembrandt, can be found here. Many of Leonardo da Vinci's pictures are also on view here, the most famous among them being the Mona Lisa, which by itself would be sufficient to fill the Louvre with visitors. Especially now that one of the century's bestsellers, The Da Vinci Code, has refocused attention on Leonardo and the Louvre. The film version of the book was shot right here and starred Tom Hanks and Audrey Tattoo. But there were earlier films made here, including the memorable Belfagor, The Phantom of the Louvre, first with Juliette Greco in the leading role, then in the remake, Sophie Marceau. Place Vendôme is also associated with the movie. The Woman of the Place Vendôme, starring Catherine Deneuve. The monumental octagonal Place Vendôme was the vision of Jean Hardouin Marsard, after whom attic rooms are also called mansards. The original occupant of the central space of the square, where once stood the palace of the Prince of Vendôme, was the equestrian statue of the Sun King. Swept away by the revolution, it was replaced in 1806 by Napoleon's statue atop a 43-meter column commemorating his victory at Austerlitz. The opera is Napoleon III's gift to Paris. He announced the competition eventually won by Charles Gagné. This was his first grand project, though later he also designed the casino at Monte Carlo. Beneath the 11,000-square-meter opera, there's a vast network of tunnels and a 1,000-square-meter artificial lake. Frederick Forsyth, the best-selling author, conducted serious research on the building. The results are published in his volume entitled The Phantom of Manhattan. In 1907, a steel vault was constructed in the depths of the labyrinth, in which they sealed recordings of the most famous opera singers to keep their voices alive for posterity. The vault was opened in 2007. It certainly is going to be elevating work to digitalize the voices of Shayapin or Caruso and guard them safely for the future. Designating the real heart of a global capital is always grounds for a good debate. In Paris, several squares vie for this honor. One of the top contenders is the Place de la Concorde. It lies next to the Seine and is the focus of several main arteries. It's hard to believe that it was once a neglected staging yard for the construction of the Louvre. Louis XV announced a competition for its development as a square that would feature his own equestrian statue. Of the 19 entries submitted, the plans of Ange Jacques Gabriel were selected. Not only did he plan the 75,000 square meter square, but also the palaces around it. Of course, the revolution got rid of Louis XIV's statue and in its stead erected the dreaded guillotine, whose victims, in addition to Louis XVI, included Marie Antoinette, Charlotte Corday, Danton, and Robespierre. The square's new name, Concorde, meaning peace and understanding, is an attempt to lay its infamous history to rest. The obelisk at the square's center was donated to the French people by Mohammed Ali, the ruler of Egypt. His grandiose gesture was made at the suggestion of Champollion. The sea transport of the 220-ton stone was accomplished by the naval engineer Le Bas. The Marley Stallions, this magnificent statue, was originally intended to grace the royal stables. Here it has become a favorite target of tourist cameras.
it is not without reason that Paris has earned the title of the capital of fashion. Look no further than the streets or shops around the Etoile. The prices in these boutiques are astronomical, while great shopping is to be had in the famous department stores Saint Martin and Galleries Lafayette. Just as in other capital cities throughout Western Europe, here too, shopping is a favorite pastime. Keep in mind that France once had an extensive colonial empire and still continues to reap the advantages of these historic connections. However surprising it may be, Paris is a port city, a seaport for goods transported by sea. The cargo is transferred at the Atlantic coast 250 kilometers away from ocean liners to barges suitable for the Seine. On the Etoile, or Star Square, 12 avenues converge in a single giant roundabout at the center of which stands the Arc de Triomphe, or Arch of Triumph. This renowned monument of Paris is a product of Napoleon's delusions of grandeur. In honor of his victorious troops, he ordered the erection of a triumphal arch on the scale of those of the Roman emperors. But while those arches of long ago were barely higher than 20 meters, Napoleon's measures 50. To exemplify the enormity of his dimensions, daredevil stunt pilots have flown under the arch on numerous occasions. Plans for the Arc de Triomphe were drawn up by Jean-François Chagrin, and numerous masters labored on the reliefs, among them the renowned François Rude. Napoleon, as well as the funeral procession of Victor Hugo, had passed under the arch. Following World War I, the memorial of the unknown French soldier was placed here. The bronze shield seen on the memorial was placed there after another worldwide catastrophe, a gift from General Eisenhower. At the time when Remarque was writing his famous novel, Nazi soldiers marched in the shade of the triumphal arch. Today, only peaceful tourists. The Circus of Rampois with its carriage station brings back memories of the past, as does the Comédie Française nearby. However, the Renault Museum is a tribute to the motorization of the recent past. The giant cube of the Défense, on the other hand, happens to point toward the future. The Défense quarter can be said to portray the Paris of the years 2000-something, as seen through the eyes of the 1980s. The silhouette of high-rises and skyscrapers have dominated the Parisian skyline for nearly 30 years. The inner districts of the city have in many respects maintained the townscape established by Baron Haussmann, the prefect of Napoleon III. The suburbs like Saint-Denis, Colombe, Mont-Valerien, Malmaison, Saint-Claude, Roussy, and others, by contrast, portray a more modern style. The outlying parts of the city have, at least in their names, preserved the once small villages and market towns that have long been engulfed by the big city. The traffic jams of Paris are due primarily to commuters living in the outlying green belts who come to work in the offices and shops of the city center. Tourists do well to avoid the morning and evening rush hours. Practically all of the famous sites are easily accessible with public transportation, especially with the extensive underground system. The Cube of the Défense also serves as a lookout tower. From here, it's worth it to use binoculars or a teleobjective lens to zoom in on the legendary rooftops of the city. Urban decentralization has been among the plans of the Paris municipality for many decades, but implementation is still a long way off. Where there are high-rise buildings, you also need reliable lifts as well. In Paris, we can find vast numbers of these. The Cube of the Défense serves also as an outlook point. It's nice to cast a glance at the legendary roofs through binoculars or teleobjectives. Everyone is familiar with the symbol of Paris, the Eiffel Tower. However, few know that Eiffel, who also designed the West train station in Budapest, initially intended to erect the famous tower in the capital of Hungary. Hungary, of course, refused, as did the United States. Only in France were there enthusiastic supporters of the structure, but just as many opposed it, such as Dumas, Gounod, Verlaine, Clemenceau, Garnier, and Maupassant. As unbelievable as it is true, the committee for the elimination of the tower they established is still diligently continuing their work. The tower was built by Gustav Eiffel for the 1889 World Exposition. 
Completion of the tower took two years, and it was the tallest building in the world until 1929, when the Chrysler Building in New York surpassed it. A few statistics about the structure. The height of the Eiffel Tower, including the broadcast tower, is 327 meters. The base of the tower is 129 meters wide. The 15,000 metal components are adjoined by 2.5 million screws. Repainting of the tower takes place every seven years and requires 50 tons of paint. The bases of the tower reach to five meters below the bottom of the Seine. The stability of the structure ensures a sway of no more than 12 centimeters. Of the more than 100 million visitors to the site, only a fraction braved climbing of the 1,700 steps to the top. The rest use the elevator. Allegedly, the number of visitors registered here every year is twice that of the visitors to the Louvre. It's said that on a clear day, the tower is visible from an 80-kilometer radius, but in any case, it is certainly visible from anywhere in Paris. An exceptional view for photographs of the tower is afforded atop the Arc de Triomphe, and the structure towering above the Parisian rooftops and garret rooms has always been a recurring theme of landscape painters of the city. The terrace of the Chalot Palace also provides a spectacular view of the Old Dame, as the French nicknamed her. The Mars Promenade under the tower with its row of trees is a popular resting spot for locals and tourists alike. The Chalot Palace complex is home to a number of cultural institutions. The 3,000-seat theater was considered to be one of the most modern in Europe at the time it was built. The Museum of Anthropology serves those interested in anthropology and ethnography. The Museum of Historic Monuments is worth the attention of not only experts in the field, but tourists as well, as is the Naval Museum and the Giant Aquarium. Models of famous explorer ships as well as artifacts are on display at the Naval Museum. A comparable exhibit of artistic ships carvings can only be seen in Greenwich. The raft with which Alain Bombard made his solo crossing of the Atlantic is also displayed. From the Chaillot Palace, we take an easterly direction until we reach the gardens of the Tuileries, where we head north to the famous part of town, Montmartre. In the heart of Montmartre, the oldest church in Paris, and a basilica dedicated in the 20th century, St. Peter's and the Sacré-Cœur, respectively, stand opposite each other. Building of the former was started in 1133, while the latter was named after the Sacred Heart in 1873, but consecrated only in 1919. The terraces of the monumental white marble basilica are accessible by a steep set of tears or the cogged wheel. The church with five domes and built in the shape of a Greek Orthodox cross houses the largest mosaic picture in France. The mosaic of the Sacred Heart measures 475 square meters. The bell in the 80-meter high tower is among the largest in the world. It weighs 19 tons and was a donation of the Bishopric of Savoy. The dome of the basilica provides two spectacular views. From without, it gives a panoramic view of the city, while the interior balconies reveal the beauty of the church from within. The title of the church history collection in the crypt from the Druids to the present, speaks volumes. Even today, the Montmartre is an unparalleled tourist area, one of the best known and evocative quarters of Paris. The settlement atop a 100-meter hill was named after a pagan temple erected in honor of Mercury. It's on this hill that St. Denis is thought to have performed his miracle. The streets bear the names of residents living in the 12th century convent found here. The center of the quarter is the Terta Square, where painters sitting at terrace cafes capture the atmosphere and bustle of the narrow streets and the white dome of Sacré-Cœur. Perhaps the tiniest square of the city, Calvary Square, and the narrow Rue Saint-Rustique best reflect the once-bohemian atmosphere of this part of the city. 
The garret rooms in the area still look like the set for the film L'Air de Paris by Jean Gabin. The famous La Bonne Franquette Eatery, whose terrace has been immortalized in the painting by Vincent van Gogh, still caters to guests. On moonlit nights and misty autumn mornings, one can practically see the shadows of Modigliani and Degas, Renoir and Toulouse-Lautrec, Picasso and Monet. The history of Paris begins back in the distant past. Julius Caesar, Attila the Hun, Western Goths and Normans all had eyes for the city. Although the Sorbonne was founded in 1253, the city boasts the existence of a university as early as 1150. Abelard, seeking independence from the bishopric, established the first university on Mount Genevieve. The student quarter, the Quartier Latin, is aptly named as the language of teaching was naturally Latin. King Philippe Auguste had the city of Paris surrounded by a town wall and exacted a toll from all those entering to augment his revenues. By the end of the 12th century, Notre Dame had been completed and the building of the Louvre was soon to follow. The city was rampaged by pillaging English, who even the Virgin of Orleans could not stop. The plague and famine left devastation in their path. The kings did not concern themselves much with Paris. They lived in their castles in the Loire Valley. Following the dark Middle Ages, the light of the Renaissance shines across the Parisian sky. Henry IV decided Paris was worth dealing with. By the reign of the Sun King, Paris had become a metropolis of the day, where the darkness of the night was dissipated by candlelit streets. As a general, Napoleon embarked on restructuring the city and life in it. Napoleon III controlled the further building of the city through the prefect and baron houseman. The basic structure of the current road system was established at that time. The current image of the multifaceted metropolis developed over the centuries. A mere 25 kilometers from the capital city, Versailles owes its fame to the Sun King. In the surrounding royal forest and hunting grounds stood the modest hunting lodge of Louis XIII. His successor, afflicted with a passion for overstated luxury, however, envisioned a grandiose royal palace here, the likes of which were unparalleled in Europe. The colossal project was started in 1661. 30,000 workers labored under the direction of architect Laveau, but his life proved too short for the completion of the palace, which was continued by Hardelin Massard. The park, complete with lakes, 1,400 fountains, terraces, and garden pavilions, was designed by Lenotre. It is not surprising that the legacy of the dazzling Sun King contains more than just the spectacular Versailles Palace, but a spectacular debt to boot. A generation later, Louis XVI was faced with a far greater threat, that of revolution. Under the reign of Louis Philippe, the castle functioned as a museum. The palace served as the scene of numerous significant historic and political events over the ages. This was where the peace treaty bringing the American War of Independence to a close was signed. This is where William I was proclaimed Kaiser of Germany, and this is later also the site for the declaration of the peace treaty to end World War I and abase the German Reich. For those interested in the events staged in the palace, the entertaining The Mysterious Past of Versailles by Alain de Coe is a must read. The building overlooks the Square of Arms. It is divided into three sections, the Court of Ministers, the Royal Court, and the Marble Court, which the windows of the Royal Bedroom faced. The protruding central portion of the building is the work of Laveau. The famous 73-meter-long mirror hall, a masterpiece of Hardot and Moissart, overlooks the park and contains sculptures of the most acclaimed French artists of the time. Mansart also created the Royal Bedchamber and Royal Grand Stairway. The palace also houses a chapel, congressional hall, concert hall, and opera house. Access to the park grounds is free to visitors, but viewing of the spectacular interior halls and chambers is allowed only in organized tours for an admission fee. It is calculated that upwards of 10,000 people, including footmen, servants, cooks, horse grooms, drivers, and gardeners, were employed at one time in the service of the castle. Today, apart from the guards and cleaning staff, hundreds of gardeners and landscapists groom the park grounds. Over 150,000 flowers are planted here every year, but the park itself is worth looking at. The terraced and staggered fountains are connected by 20 kilometers of pipework circulating 6,000 cubic meters of water. Among the countless statues and sculptures of varying grade, perhaps the statue of Bacchus and the Pyramid Spring by Girardon are the most valuable. 
For those with more time at their disposal, it is well worth seeing the residence of Marie Antoinette, the Petit and Grand Castle of Trianon, which became historically significant from a European perspective. As early as the 1950s, the legendary American cartoon artist Walt Disney had envisioned the Disney theme park to delight audiences both young and old. This theme park would be entirely different from all amusement parks of the time. The Storyland Empire soon conquered the world after parks were established in California, Florida, and later Japan. The first and only Disneyland in Europe was opened outside Paris, near Versailles. All of the Disney theme parks adhere to a common concept. There's an Adventureland, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland. The youngest can wander about in the House of the Seven Dwarfs, little boys can discover the island of Tom Sawyer, bigger kids can climb up to the tree house of the Robinson Crusoe family. More daring kids can experience space travel on Earth and other simulation rides, or brave the horrors of the haunted house. A luxury hotel was built on park premises, where naturally the cost of a room includes admission to the park. The hill overlooking the village of the Wild West features a roller coaster and wild water rides splashing unsuspecting passers-by. A paddle steamboat, the Mark Twain, floats along the man-made river, and one should never be surprised to bump into Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, or Winnie the Pooh on the park grounds. The buildings along the romantic Main Street resemble New Orleans. The terraced, wrought-iron barred buildings house numerous restaurants, shops, and patisseries. An elegant old-fashioned train travels in front of us, but we're welcome to travel in old-timer automobiles as well. We can pose for a photo with Pluto, Aladdin, Tigger, Snow White, or Sleeping Beauty. Get an overview of the park from the monorail or the aerial cable car. Cars of the time enhance the atmosphere of the time. We can admire the dream castle of Sleeping Beauty, marvel at stuntman shows, and watch the sensational musical parade. Just before closing, the park bids farewell to visitors with a spectacular fireworks display. Paris is famous for many things, one of which is its nightlife. The center of the entertainment quarter, the place immortalized in so many chansons, is the Place Pigalle. The sails of the Moulin Rouge, the red windmill, turn slowly on the nearby Boulevard de Clichy. The club first opened in 1889 and was made famous by the music of Offenbach, the Quinquin, and the paintings of Toulouse-Lautrec. By the turn of the century, spectacular review shows dazzled audiences. The revival of the club in the 1920s after a fire consumed the building during World War I has been going strong ever since. It's become a must-see attraction for tourists, as has another review theater, the Folie Bergère. The film Moulin Rouge with Nicole Kidman received an Oscar and gives account of the golden days of the club with meticulous precision. Nights in Paris offer a different kind of attraction, which is no less exciting than those of the daytime. Many bars and clubs feature striptease shows, go-go girls, and hot live shows, while small cabarets are brimming with racy and risque skits. The larger reviews come complete with glitzy sets, sumptuous costumes, and long-legged dancing girls. But there are also piano bars, discos, and game rooms to name just a few of the many venues of entertainment. Yes, this too is Paris one of the many faces of the city. 
the French capital certainly lives up to all of the images visitors have come to expect. The glamorous laser show from the top of the Eiffel Tower attracts vast crowds of onlookers, even at midnight. In Paris, the day never ends. The hustle and bustle is the same by day and by night. <laughs> <laughs>